Good day, and welcome to the webinar, Saving Lives and Preventing Injuries, How to Calculate the Cost of Traffic Safety Interventions. Our webinar today is hosted by NCSL's Natural Resources and Infrastructure Committee and is a part of the committee's 2015 Spring Webinar Series. For a complete schedule and registration, please visit our website at www.ncsl.org. My name is Ann Teagan, and I will be moderating the webinar today. I am a program principal with the Transportation Program at the National Conference of State Legislatures, and I cover traffic safety issues, including teen driving, occupant protection, and impaired driving. Before we get started with today's panel, I would like to remind participants that NCSL is a bipartisan membership organization of state legislatures. NCSL advocates for the interests of states and provides policymakers the opportunity to exchange ideas. And this webinar is a platform for an information exchange. Our webinar today is being recorded, and registrants will be able to access a recording of the webinar and presentation slides on NCSL's website. We will send out a notice shortly with a link to these resources. You can also download the webinar and slides right now by clicking on the Media Library button, which looks like a piece of paper with a blue bar graph in front of it. I would also like to remind everyone that the Natural Resources and Infrastructure Committee has some other webinars coming up in the next few weeks. And you may be interested in those, and you may register today. And as we begin, I want to thank both the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for their support of today's webinar. Year after year, traffic safety is consistently one of the top 10 subjects that NCSL receives information requests on from policymakers. And that is simply because no matter who you are, a driver, bicyclist, or a pedestrian, or where you come from, from New York City to Independence, Kansas, traffic safety affects every American. And we're glad to have you here today to learn about traffic safety and the new tool from the CDC that can actually calculate the cost of saving lives and preventing injury from motor vehicle crashes. We will have a question and answer period after our two presentations, so please enter your questions in the Q&A box, and I will ask our speakers to address them following both their presentations. Our presenters today are Essie Wagner and Dr. Erin Saberschatz. Essie Wagner is the Special Assistant to the Associate Administrator in the Office of Research and Program Development at the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. In this role, she is a policy advisor on behavioral road safety issues, including impaired driving, occupant protection, vulnerable road users, and the use of law enforcement in traffic safety. Essie earned a Master's of Arts degree in Human Factors Psychology from George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia, and a Bachelor of Arts degree in Psychology from the College of Worcester in Worcester, Ohio. Our second speaker, who will discuss the MVPIX tool, is Dr. Erin Saberschatz. She is responsible for overseeing all of CDC's transportation safety activities, which includes motor vehicle injury prevention. The transportation safety team's focus areas include seatbelt use, child passenger safety, safe teen driving, alcohol impaired driving, tribal motor vehicle injury prevention, and older adult mobility. Dr. Saberschatz received her Bachelor of Arts degree in biology with a minor in French from Texas A&M, and her MPH in epidemiology from the Texas A&M School of Rural Public Health in College Station, Texas. And she received her PhD in epidemiology and a certificate in public health preparedness and disaster response from the University of Pittsburgh. She is a lieutenant commander in the United States Public Health Service. So, Essie, here to talk about the National Highway Transportation Administration's role in this. Essie, the stage is yours. Okay, then. Thank you very much for your introduction there. I'm really happy to be on the panel today because partly really because it highlights collaboration between NHTSA and CDC. We have an MOU in place to help us find and use ways to work together to address the unintentional injuries that result from motor vehicle crashes. This MOU is a really important way to leverage the depth of skills that they have over at CDC 
And it also saves us from working at cross purposes and helps us save money because we don't have to hire outside firms when we have projects like this that align. And we're going to be hearing about that more later on. First, let me tell you a little bit about NHTSA and what it is that we are trying to accomplish in life. We really, we have the best mission of any agency in, in all of the government. Uh, we are really about saving lives and preventing injuries. And we have three pieces that feed that mission. And the first is that we regulate motor vehicle safety equipment. Uh, that's our seat belts and airbags and headlights and everything that keeps the vehicle safe. But we also have to do things to keep uh, the drivers safe and the occupants and pedestrians and bicyclists as well. So we do research and demonstration programs and look at the data to find ways to do things better. And the third piece of that, it, of what we do, is to support the state activities through our highway safety offices. So there's, you know, we have grant programs and technical assistance for those folks. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go along. The behavioral safety issues that we cover include impaired driving, occupant protection, including seat belts and child safety seat use, motorcyclist safety, pedestrian bicycle safety, older drivers, school buses. And, and we provide training and program support for these issues um, related for, for law enforcement. So if they need to address any of those, the law enforcement can, can get some information on that. And we're also responsible for a range of EMS issues. So we have a big mission in saving lives, and we have to use all of the tools in the toolbox to get there. We're a data-driven agency. So in order to accomplish the mission, we need to figure out where we are. In 2013, there were 32,719 fatalities. That's a lot. Uh, and it's a hard number to tackle. So we do look closer. Breaking it down, we look at the, the single largest contributor, which is alcohol. In 2013, there were 10,076 alcohol-impaired driving fatalities. That's nearly a third of the traffic deaths in any given year. Uh, this is just the 2013 number. To solve that, we really need to know more. So who is in those crashes? So we do some, some breakdowns to figure out what's going on in there. So what we found was that there are 21% of drivers in fatal crashes had BACs of 0.08 or higher. And we need to know a little bit more about that so, who, so we can figure out how to focus our efforts and focus our energies and our dollars that we spend. You know, we see that there are only 2% of large truck drivers were, uh, had that BAC of 08 or, or higher. Yeah, so we don't need to focus on them. Um, whereas on the other hand, we have 27% of motorcyclists who have an 08 or high, 0.08 or higher. Uh, so we need, do know that we need to focus more on motorcyclists in this case. In addition to knowing who is in the crashes, we need to know what happens so we can work to prevent them. Uh, as you can see here, uh, in showing the data from our National Motor Vehicle Crash Causation Survey, we learned that 94% of the critical reasons for crashes are driver-related. Addressing driver behavior is a key prevention strategy in saving lives and preventing injuries. And how do we do that? Uh, one way that we try to save lives is to administer grant, the grants program in the states. Over $500 million goes to states and territories, and we need to be sure that the programs they plan to invest in are effective. But first, in order to save lives and prevent injuries, you need to know what you're aiming for. So you need to understand the problem. You need to select appropriate countermeasures and plan. And you need to apply the countermeasures and measure change. And this is why we have these agreed upon uh, safety performance measures that you see here. Each state's highway safety office submits a highway safety plan that describes what they're going to do and how they're going to do it and how they're going to measure success. Then our NHTSA regional offices provide technical support in the administration of the grants program to help states implement the effective strategies. And they also monitor the use of the grants funds for appropriate use. Now, much of what they recommend is available in the resource countermeasures that work. And I encourage you to take a look at that later in the resources tab that uh, Anne pointed out earlier. 
Now, measuring changes over time is another important element of what we do to determine how we need to focus our efforts. I mean, looking at the relative proportions of those killed in 2004 compared to just 10 years later in 2013, we see that there's been a lot of success in passenger vehicle occupants. Those are the, the lower red and white columns there. But motorcyclists, pedestrians, bicyclists, and heavy trucks have all seen increases in proportions. So we need to do more in those areas nationwide. But what about the, the state level or in your state in particular? If you want to look at the data for your state, going back years, we have it at the NHTSA website. If you look at the top circle there, you can go to www.nitsa.gov. Then you can select the Data tab, which is the next circle down there. And then you can select Search State-Specific Information. And we have data going all the way to the county level. So you can find that information that will help you figure out what's happening in your community that you need to solve the problems for. But you don't have to do it alone. Um, if you're looking to do some problem identification or research on the problems in your jurisdiction, you might want to ask for help. Uh, first, your Highway Safety Office knows what challenges your state is facing. You can find them through the Governor's Highway Safety Association at ghsa.org. Or if you're looking for some more specific information on our grants programs, you can talk to our regional offices. They're staffed with professionals who are really familiar with each state's challenges and the unique circumstances that they have. And finally, if you want specific analyses or if you have data questions, you can ask our National Center for Statistics and Analysis for help. That's what NCSA stands for there. And truly, finally, if you have any outstanding questions, you can ask me. This is my contact information right here, and I'm happy to connect you with the right people. That is it for me, and I'm really happy to see what's going to happen with the rest of the presentation today. Thanks. Thank you so much, Essie. So Dr. Sabershots, we are very excited to hear about NV Picks, and the floor is yours. OK, great. Thank you for having me. And Essie, thanks for that great introduction. Um, as was mentioned, today I'm talking about a new tool that CDC released in October of last year. And it's called the Motor Vehicle Prioritizing Interventions and Cost Calculator for States, or for short, MVPICS. And really, this tool was developed to help states reduce motor vehicle injuries and deaths. So to begin with, I wanted to give a little context behind CDC's winnable battles. So the topic areas you see listed on these slides were selected by Dr. Tom Frieden, uh, CDC's director, as areas that have a large public health burden, but also have known effective interventions for reducing that burden. And motor vehicle injury prevention, therefore, is one of CDC's winnable battles. We have a large public health burden, as Essie just highlighted. And also, we know that there are lots of effective interventions that can be put into place to reduce this public health burden, many of which, as Essie mentioned, are in NHTSA's Countermeasures That Work document. You really should take a look at that if you haven't looked at it before. So another snapshot of the motor vehicle crash health burden, and part of the reason that we focus on motor vehicle injury prevention here at CDC, is that it's a leading cause of death in the United States. There are over 32,000 deaths in 2013. And broken down, that's 90 deaths a day due to motor vehicle crashes. CDC also put out a report in conjunction with the NV PICS called the CDC Vital Signs, looking at non-fatal crash injuries in the year 2012. And in that report, we found that more than 2.5 million emergency department visits were, occurred due to crash injuries in 2012, or about 7,000 people every day went to an emergency department. Of those people, nearly 200,000 were then hospitalized in 2012. Or in, in other words, 1 million days were spent in the hospital each year by Americans due to motor vehicle crashes. So another way to look at the data is that for every one person killed in a motor vehicle crash, eight people were hospitalized and 100 people were treated and released from an emergency department. And we also know that motor vehicle crashes have a large cost. So the same report that I mentioned, the vital signs that looked at non-fatal crash costs, estimated that $18 billion in lifetime medical costs were spent due to motor vehicle crashes that were non-fatal. So that's 
In, more, in those cases, more than 75% of the costs occurred during the first 18 months post-crash. We also estimated that an emergency department visit cost about $3,300 per injured person, and each hospitalization cost about $57,000 per injured person. We also estimated that there were $33 billion in lifetime work loss costs due to these non-fatal crashes. So as both Essie and I just highlighted, motor vehicle injuries are a significant public health problem, and they're also a CDC winnable battle. And we know that there's a wide range of evidence-based interventions that are available for states to help prevent these motor vehicle crashes and the resulting injuries and deaths. However, states must choose among many options when deciding what to put into place. Many interventions are implemented at the state level. States have to prioritize their options. And in order to prioritize properly, states need information about the costs and benefits of each option. So taking this into account, that's why we created CDC's NVPIX. It provides this information to states in a user-friendly way. So I wanted to spend a few minutes on the tool development. However, if, if you are really interested, I'll show you later in the presentation where you can see the full methodology of the development of NVPIX. So in your spare reading time, we have about a 250-page report that really breaks down all the methods that went into creating NVPIX. So the first step of creating NVPIX was to define the appropriate interventions for the tool. So we wanted interventions that um, really were obviously evidence-based interventions. And we, we wanted to select the interve interventions based on some specific criteria. So we looked at the type of intervention, the effectiveness, the state's role in implementation, and the current use of the intervention. So at CDC, we really focus on the behavioral aspects of motor vehicle crashes, sometimes called the human factors. So we looked at behavioral specific interventions that could be put into place. We looked at their effectiveness, so how, what the science and the research has shown to how effective these different interventions are. And we only selected those that had been shown to have a high level of effectiveness. And then we wanted to be sure that the state had a role in implementation so that the MVPIX tool would really provide the state with information they can use to make decisions. And then we also looked at the current use of the interventions. We wanted to select interventions or interventions that a state that not a large number of states had already put into place so that there was room for action. So ultimately, the 12 interventions that we ended up selecting were red light camera automated enforcement, speed camera automated enforcement, alcohol interlocks, sobriety checkpoints, saturation patrol, bicycle helmet laws for children, motorcycle helmet use laws, high visibility enforcement for seatbelt and child restraint or booster seat laws, and primary enforcement seatbelt use laws, as well as vehicle impoundment, license plate impoundment, and limits on diversion and plea agreements. So that was the first step, is determining which interventions to use. The next was to gather cost and benefit information and create the estimates that really are the data behind the NVPIX tool. So NVPIX, calcula we calculated the expected costs and benefits. So the costs include the monetary costs of implementing, as well as the costs paid by individuals to the state. So how much does it cost to put this intervention in place, and then how much would an individual have to pay out to a state if they were cited under any of the specific interventions? The benefits that we looked at were the number of injuries prevented, as well as the number of lives saved, and then the monetized value of the injuries prevented and lives saved. The data sources that we used to get these estimates were um, for costs, we looked at published articles and reports, as well as we conducted interviews with state officials and safety experts to get their real-world experience of how much it costs to put these interventions into place. And then for the benefits, we look at peer-reviewed articles and reports that used reduction in deaths as a basis for evaluating effectiveness. So then with these costs and benefits, we used a combination of new and existing estimates. So for the implementation costs and revenues, we generated new estimate, estimates, and these were based on the interviews that we did at the state level. And then for effective interventions on injuries and deaths, as well as the medical productivity and other costs 
associated with injuries and deaths. We combine these to synthesize this existing information, and then we adjusted this data to be state-specific. So that's another benefit of MVPICS is that the state can get state-specific estimates. Also within MVPICS, it provides two different types of analyses that the states can use. First is the basic cost effectiveness analysis. So this is really a prioritized list of interventions based on the individual cost effectiveness ratios or really it compares the interventions that are at a one-on-one -on -one level. And then the portfolio analysis provides an optimized set of interventions that accounts for non-additive effects of related interventions. Or more plainly stated, an example of the portfolio analysis would be if you put two interventions into place, say for alcohol-impaired driving, that are both, um, you could pretend they were both 100% effective at reduce of eliminating alcohol-impaired driving, if a state put both of those interventions into place, you wouldn't have a 200% reduction in alcohol-impaired driving crashes. You could only have a 100% reduction. So that the portfolio analysis takes into account those interdependencies between the different interventions that can be put into place. So now I'm going to run, run through a relatively quick demonstration of MVPICS. But um, just as Essie made herself available, I'm really more than happy to answer anyone's questions, specific questions, and or run you through a demonstration with your state data um, if you were interested. So this is the CDC landing page for MVPICS. Um, this is the web page where you would go to down at the bottom. That's the web page for MVPICS. And you would start by clicking on this Launch MVPICS link over here in this purple box. That, once you click on the Launch MVPIX, it will take you to this landing page. Here is where you would select your state. So your state of interest would go in here. And then you can see that there are four little buttons here. So there's an introduction that provides just a quick review of what the MVPIX offers and how to use it. There's the basic cost effectiveness analysis, which is kind of that one-on-one -on -one analysis that can be done. The portfolio analysis, which is highlighted here in green, um, personally because it's my favorite analysis because it does take into account if you put in more than one intervention in place. And then last is the library, which is where you can find your user guides, fact sheets, and really all the information that goes into making MVPICS. So here we'll click on portfolio analysis, and then the next it takes you to Colorado. So in this instance, I selected Colorado as the state that I wanted to analyze, and then I picked the portfolio analysis. So here's Colorado, and then here are the 12 interventions that are available in, in MVPICS. So these boxes here are all checked. That's the, the um, default is that all of the boxes will be checked. And you can see in the next column right next to that, there are kind of grayed out checks. I'm going to actually allow my cursor to work. Um, so here you can see that there are currently implemented um, interventions. So we also determined in each state which interventions were already into place so that the user didn't have to go ahead and look up which, which interventions were in place. So we provided that information to them. For this demonstration, I'm going to look at seatbelt enforcement campaign as well as primary enforcement seatbelt law in Colorado. And so here's also where the user would put in their annual implementation budget, so how much money they had to spend on motor vehicle injury prevention. So I'm going to go ahead and just select the two boxes for seatbelt enforcement campaign and primary enforcement seatbelt law. And I'm also going to put in $5 million. And then you click on Run the Model, and here's what you get. You can see here in, in the, the top will be the green will be green. So the MVPIX has said that with $5 million, you can put these two interventions into place. These were the only two we selected. So if we would have selected more, it's possible that some of them would have been in this red category below. And that would be because we didn't have enough um, funding in order to put those interventions in place. And MVPIX prioritizes the inter interventions based on how many injuries can be prevented and lives can be saved. So we see here that with our analyses, both seatbelt enforcement campaign and primary enforcement seatbelt law have been selected. And then down here are the summary results for the interventions chosen. So the total cost for both of these 
interventions to be put into place is $4.5 million. And then here are the benefits. So we see here that there are, with, with these two interventions put into place, Colorado can expect that 43 fatalities would not occur or would be reduced and that 4,543 injuries would be prevented. And then the total monetized value of these injuries prevented and lives saved is $189 million. And so again, this is, this is the, the output of the tool for you to focus on to get the total cost of the interventions that were selected up here in green, and then the total benefits and fatalities reduced. And then we also provide this breakdown of total cost. So you saw the cost was about that $4.5 million. Well, what is that exactly? And so we have 10 different cost components that are within MVPICS that gives you an idea of what, what charges, what costs go into determining, um, determining these cost values. So you can see where you'd be spending your money. And so again, we had $5 million. And of that $5 million, here's where it broke down. Um, we also include offender-borne costs and costs to comply with the law as an output for MVPICS. But these two pieces do not actually go into the cost of implementation. We just know that these are two pieces of information that a state might want when considering putting an, um, an intervention into place. So you can see here that the fines and fees are this negative $2.3 million. This actually means that the state, this is the estimate of the money that the state or the revenue that the state would generate by having these two interventions into place. Um, knowing that this can be um, not, and, uh, okay, so the assumption with this money is that this money goes right back into MVPICS and can be used to implement other interventions. Now we know that's not always the case for a state. And so we allow a state to make a run without the fees, with the fees, ex fees and fines excluded, meaning that if in your state you could not use revenue generated from any of these motor vehicle interventions to put more interventions into place, you can actually run the tool excluding the fines to see what you could actually afford um, with the budget that you have. Another thing that the tool that we've built into it is that you can run a sensitivity analysis. So I'll give a quick example of that. So within the tool, like I said, we have all this data that really goes into generating the, the costs um, as well as the benefits. And through the sensitivity analysis, you can see what the default value is for all of the pieces of data that go into the tool. Well, say over time things change and a new study comes out with updated estimates for injuries prevented or fatalities reduced. You could then go in and actually put a user value over here and then regenerate the estimates so you can see what the updated uh, output would be. So an example of that is, so say here we have the implementation cost. Cost for seatbelt enforcement campaign is this amount right here. We'll say cost went up for whatever reason and really now it's actually $5 million to put this seatbelt enforcement campaign in. And so we would rerun the model. And then you'll see that primary enforcement seatbelt law is the only thing that's selected by MVPICS because the seatbelt enforcement campaign ended up costing more than the budget that we had provided. So that's just an example of a different way that you can use the tool. Even as more data becomes available, you're able to go in and change the values as you know more or say you feel the assumptions aren't quite right for your state. So as I said, then you could pick the one intervention with, that, with your $5 million budget. And then again, you'll see that the cost total, the benefits, and the number of injuries and fatalities reduced is slightly changed based on the fact that you only have one intervention into place. And so finally, just back to the CDC's landing page, um, this is where you can find all the documentation that goes into MVPICS. There's the full project report, which is that really um, uh, the full project report behind how we created MVPICS, all the assumptions, all of the data, et cetera. And um, I should also mention that uh, RAND Corporation was our contract for this, and this is a really, really nice report um, that you can read, and I really do believe it helps you understand MVPICS. So if you have economists that work for you in your state, 
or anyone in your DOT or Department of Health um, that wants a fuller understanding, this is where to point them. And then the user guide is also within MVPix, which gives kind of, kind of what I've done, a screen-by-screen -screen shot, a walkthrough of how to use MVPix and how to interpret the data you're getting. And then there's also intervention fact sheets that are available so that you can really understand what all of the interventions are that are in MVPix, as well as provi it provides some resources of where you can find out more about the intervention. And so just in, in conclusion, we know that preventing injury saves money. Crash injuries have gone down in recent years, and there was almost 400,000 fewer ED visits and about 5,700 fewer hospitalizations in 2012 compared to 2002. And this equals $1.7 billion in avoided medical costs and $2.3 billion in avoided work loss costs. And these were only for non-fatal injury crashes um, in the United States. And so we know that preventing injuries, motor vehicle crash-related injuries and deaths, not only you know, in increases quality of life, keeps families together, and prevents disability, it also saves money. And so we, you know, we know that more can be done to prevent motor vehicle injuries and deaths. Here are a few resources that are available to you all. There's the link for the MVPix. CDC also recently put out state-based fact sheets on restraint use as well as alcohol-impaired driving. So I've provided the links to those fact sheets. Uh, within the restraint fact sheet, there's also information on child passenger safety. CDC has prevention status reports, which provide state-specific um, information on several uh, interventions that we recommend. The most recent prevention status report came, was a 2013. We're currently working on the 2015 version of the prevention status report, so watch for an update to come out. We also have the community guide. Um, the community guide reviews look at the, the evidence behind different interventions and make a recommendation of whether or not um, specific interventions should be put into place. And then, of course, as we've mentioned several times, there's NHTSA's Countermeasures That Work document. And I provided the link for that as well. And that's all I have, so thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sabershot. And now we will open up uh, to questions. And if you'll please enter your questions in the Q&A box, and I will ask our speakers to address them. Um, so one of the first questions that I see here is um, what type of and what type of injuries is really defined and how is the term injury defined? Sure. So that injury is how we actually define that. Just to be honest, I would have to go back and check specifically. However, what we would do is we use the we use the estimate of injury reduction from the actual literature that is out there. And so there have been some estimations around how many injuries would be reduced based on population, other things within a state. And so we really we apply um, we apply the the crash rates as well as the amounts of injuries reduced to the also population of a state to get at those estimates. And so some of that um, comes down to data issues of how well we capture injury. So most likely injuries would be serious injuries to where they are reported to an emergency department and or hospitalized. So it wouldn't be someone that just complained, complained of some sort of pain that didn't seek medical care. Um, but if I can look up the specific details of how it was defined if you're still interested. Great. Thank you. And then uh, could you also, let's see, um, I have a question here that says there's a focus on serious injuries and is it possible to separate um, serious injuries from perhaps less serious injuries? Um, not from the tool perspective. So we just looked at the number of injuries that could be reduced. As I just said, they're probably the more serious injuries. And some of that gets down to the, the way that data are collected and reported. Um, so a little bit of a tangent, but something that I think would be important for the, the audience is another thing that several of the federal agencies are looking at right now is how we can better link data in the states. So there's a need for us to be able to link crash reports, police data, um, with medical data. 
So really, the, the, you've got two different systems going right now. You have medical data, and then you also have this police-reported crash data. And in order to get a better view of the entire situation around a crash, we need to be able to link those two data sets together. Some states are effectively linking data together, these, these data sources together. Um, and through our memorandum of understanding and our long history of working with NHTSA, CDC and NHTSA have collaborated and we did an evaluation of states that have data linkage systems in place. Um, that report will be coming out this year. Um, so you will be able to read about states that have data linkage, their barriers for data linkage, how they could improve data linkage, because this is really an area that moving forward to really understand all of the pieces of crashes, especially the you know, mild, moderate, and severe injury, that we need to have that data in place to be able to look at it. Great, thank you. Um, I have another question here, um, Dr. Sabershatz, about could you expand a bit on how you generated the estimates for the cost components, such as the patrol time or the DMV um, fines, et cetera? Sure. So really for the cost estimates, we, that was one piece in the literature that was somewhat lacking. And so that's why we did the interviews with states that had put these interventions into place. So we interviewed people um, within DOT. We talked with um, police, other people that had been actively involved in putting these um, interventions into place in their state so that we could really understand all of the costs that went into it. So it was through this interview process that we collected all the different cost data, cost information, and then came up with our estimates. Okay, and we have had a few questions too about how the 12 interventions were selected. And there's a question if um, perhaps graduated driver's licensing laws or distracted mm -hmm. driving laws were considered at all. Yeah, and so, um, Really, the, the criteria that we used for looking at which interventions to include, um, I touched on this briefly, but I can expand a little bit. And so, as I mentioned, from CDC's perspective, we really focus on the behavioral aspect of crashes. So we weren't looking at interventions that were re related to, say, safer roadways or infrastructure. That's, you know, we focus on the human factors or, or the, the, the human part of a crash, right? And so with the effective interventions that are out there, we first selected down to the behavioral interventions that were of interest to us. And then we also looked at the effectiveness. So we used the countermeasures that worked as, as kind of a springboard for selecting the interventions that we wanted to consider using in the tool. Um, because the countermeasures that work provides essentially a, a star rating to the different interventions based on review of the effectiveness of the interventions. So then we only selected interventions that had really high effectiveness marks because we, we really do focus on making sure that the things that we recommend actually work for the states because people have limited budgets. So if they're going to be spending their research, resources on things, we want to be sure that they're spending their resources on things that actually work. So again, we looked at behavioral interventions. We looked at the effectiveness. We looked at the state role in implementation, so making sure that these were actually state-specific state interventions that the state had a role in putting them into place. Um, and then we also looked at the current use of the interventions. So you could almost think of this as these are a set of almost second-tier interventions for motor vehicle injury prevention that are proven to be effective, but really aren't in high use within the states yet. So there's room for improvement in the states or room for more interventions to be put into place. Um, and the reason for doing that is we didn't want to recommend things such as graduated driver's licensing systems where the states already have that in place. So we wanted to talk about interventions that could be implemented to push the needle more. So we know we can reduce more injuries, we know we can save more lives, and we wanted to focus on things that really haven't been widely used yet at a state level. And so that's, that's why we didn't use graduated driver's licensing systems, is because really, all, although there are variations in comprehensiveness of GDL in the states, all of the states have some sort of graduated driver's licensing system in place. Um, if you do want more specific recommendations 
for your state on graduated driver's licensing, I suggest looking at the prevention status report um, that I mentioned briefly. GDL is one of the indicators in the prevention status report for states, and also the 2015 prevention status report that will be coming out, um, I believe probably by the end of this year is our, our hope, or the very early part of 2016, we'll have an even more refined look at graduated driver's licensing for, for every state. Wonderful, thank you. Um, have you received uh, any responses so far uh, from, from the public about the MVPIX tool? Sure, we've received um, some, a lot of positive feedback. Right now, really, we're, we're trying to get it out there. And so if you know of someone that has used the tool, I would really enjoy talking to them and hearing about their experiences. Um, we also at CDC, we provide funding through what is called the Core Violence and Injury Prevention Program. So we work with 20 state health departments and provide them funding so that they can work in reducing injury and violence within their state. And so all of the core violence and injury prevention states are aware of MVPICS. We've encouraged them to use it. And so we're in the process of trying to collect feedback on MVPICS to find out what they liked, what they didn't like. Um, because I, I would also say that uh, I mentioned that we worked with Rand Corporation on creating MVPICS. And we, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation found out about MVPICS um, through discussions. And they, they really liked the tool. And so they've actually provided additional funding to where we'll be adding two more interventions, which will be in-person in um, license renewal for people age 55 and older, as well as increasing seatbelt fines in, in kind of a um, MVPIX, you could say, 2.0. So we're continuing to consider um, adding more interventions. We're already going to be adding two more. Um, and so we're looking for feedback now so that if there are any things that we can improve on the tool, we can do that before we launch the next round. So please mess around with it. Um, reach back out to me with your feedback and thoughts, because we'd love to hear how you all have used it or things that you think could be better. Great. Thank you so much. This has actually been really interesting. And I think that now that uh, all the attendees have seen how it works, um, they can also kind of play with MVPICS a little bit and, and see what kind of changes that their state can make to reduce injuries and deaths. Um, I don't see any more questions. Um, there was a specific question about Colorado that I think that we um, will address a little bit later, and I can email. So. If there are no other questions, um, this webinar will, is concluded. I wanted to thank, again, our speakers. And thank you out there for joining us today. And as a reminder, a recording of today's webinar and the presentation slides will be made available. And you will receive an email shortly about how to access these resources. And the email will also include information about upcoming webinars in the natural resources and and Infrastructure Committee's Spring Webinar Series. And I'd like you to thank you for your continued interest and support of NCSL. And I hope to see everyone in, in Seattle at NCSL's Legislative Summit. And have a great weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you.